Back in September of 2021, an article came out on ministrywatch.com called Just How Broken Is the Bible Translation Industry? A lot of people keep asking me about this article, so I want to take some time to address it here. My name is Andrew Case. This is the Working for the Word podcast. Let's begin. One of the reasons I have this podcast is to be a voice of reform in the whole Bible translation environment or world. This article that we're going to discuss is trying to do the same. Now, I want to give you a brief overview of some of the things this article addresses, and then I want to give some thoughts on it. So, let's get started. The article is written by Warren Cole Smith, and he starts it with this. At a recent meeting of Bible translation organizations in Newport Beach, California, one of the speakers stood at the podium and asked the 50 or so leaders a series of simple questions. How long does it take to translate the Bible? How much does it cost to translate the Bible into a new language? How many Bible translations have been completed in the past year? How many will be completed in the coming year? You'd think these questions would be simple enough to answer. After all, ask an executive of almost any business on the planet these same questions about his or her business, and that leader will have a ready answer. But if you ask a leader in the Bible translation industry, the answer you are most likely to get is... It depends. Now, that doesn't sound like a really big indictment, but he goes on and starts doing some basic math. So he says, it's important to note that the Bible translation industry is huge. And he goes on to describe the different organizations he considers part of the Bible translation movement. He says, in total, these organizations take in about $500 million a year from donors, though even this number is the subject of some dispute, as millions of dollars are passed around between Bible translation agencies, sometimes allowing for income to be counted twice, a fact which is itself an example of the problems in the industry. More on that below. Now, of course, If you want to read this whole article in totality, I will link it in the description. So he says, They've been taking money at that rate for years, if not decades. By far the largest of the Bible translation organizations is Wycliffe Bible Translators, which took in more than $227 million in 2020. And then further down, he goes on to talk about the American Bible Society that has an endowment and other assets that top $700 million. And the bottom line, he says, is there is no shortage of money in the Bible translation industry. But where is that money going? We can be sure that the vast majority of it is almost surely not going to Bible translation itself. If it was, we would have many more Bible translations than we do. How do we know that? That's what the Bible translation organizations themselves say. And then he goes on to critique what Wycliffe Associates has claimed, which I think has really expired at this point. It's kind of an old controversy. But he says, more mainstream groups also make claims that do not withstand close scrutiny. An alliance of Bible translation organizations called Illuminations has been raising money with the promise that its member organizations, which include Wycliffe Bible Translators and the American Bible Society, can translate the Bible for about $35 per verse. The Bible has about 31,000 verses, so that totals about $1 million to translate the entire Bible. Most other organizations in the Bible translation industry simply refuse to give numbers that can be checked. They announce when projects begin, but only rarely when they end, or how long they took, or how much they cost. The simple math is this, $500 million dollars. Even if you account for some revenue, double counting, and set aside money for administrative and fundraising costs, should pay for hundreds of Bible translations per year. Funding at this rate over the course of a decade should have produced thousands of Bible translations. So did it. The bleak answer? Not even close. In fact, the actual results deviate from this reasonable expectation by a factor of 10 or more. In fact, Wycliffe Bible Translators just sent out a press release announcing the completion of the 700th Bible translation. The 700th translation this decade? This century? No, the 700th Bible translation of all time. The press release included a chart indicating that the pace of Bible translations has increased in the past half century. 
In 1980, Wycliffe Bible translators said there were about 300 translations of the Bible in the world. By 2000, they had about 400. So, about 100 translations were created during the 20-year period. Now we have 700, an increase of 300 more translations created during the most recent 20-year period. That's an increase in the pace of translation. Instead of getting about five new Bible translations per year, we're getting 15. Given the abysmal starting point, this is significant improvement, but it is one-tenth the number of translations we might reasonably be expecting from the Bible translation industry. Again, a bit of simple math. The Bible translation industry is not producing a Bible translation for $1 million as Illuminations claims. The actual cost of Bible translation, the amount of money donated divided by the number of Bible translations completed, is close to $30 million per translation. So then he goes on to talk about questionable marketing. Because if you quote something like $35 per verse, then... With $2 billion, you could translate the complete Bible into 1,800 new languages. And the donors have come through. The donors have been inspired by this marketing, and they've provided an amazing amount of resources. And so the question is, did Wycliffe Bible Translators fulfill its promise, he asks. And he says the distressing answer is, once again, not even close. In 2020, they reported probably less than 20 full Bibles completed. So, a little farther down in the article, he says, A careful reader of the marketing material for the Last Languages campaign will discover two techniques common to the industry, techniques which deflect accountability. First, they are careful to talk about starting programs and translations, but rarely about finishing them. Secondly, I have already mentioned many U.S. Bible translation organizations do not actually translate Bibles. They are fundraising and project management organizations. They pass grants back and forth between themselves. Sometimes a half dozen or more Bible translation organizations will claim credit for the Bible translation work done by a small local translation team. The seed company is one example. It raises money and gives grants to organizations that are actually doing the translations. And then further down, he says, Illuminations, which we mentioned earlier, is another example. And Illuminations was founded by wealthy Christian families who were frustrated by some of the very problems I have identified here. But Illuminations has partnered with the seed company, Wycliffe Bible Translators, the American Bible Society, and others in the legacy Bible translation industry. Illuminations is new. It's well-funded, well-intentioned, and has a thoughtful strategy. But the cultural norms of the legacy Bible translators have emptied deep pockets in the past. As the old saying goes, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Now, further down in the article, he says, The 1940s and 50s model of missionary activity, which includes a heavy reliance on individual missionaries raising support with little organizational accountability, has been made obsolete by technology, rapidly changing needs, and the now calcified bureaucracy of the largest Bible translation organizations. That's not to say that there are not many heroic, sacrificial missionaries in the Bible translation industry. There are. But many off-the-record conversations I have had with them and a new generation of leaders in the Bible translation industry and their donors indicate that the current engine has broken down. They say privately they are concerned about what some of them call the poor stewardship of kingdom resources, but most of them are afraid to speak. They know that the problems Ministry Watch has identified in more than a dozen stories on this topic, articles we have written in hopes of motivating reform, represent an existential threat to the entire industry. Many have told me that they hope an intergenerational changing of the guard and leadership will solve the problem. And then he eventually ends the article saying that it's not clear that anything less than a thorough flushing of the Bible translation world will do. So let's get into my response. First of all, I want to just acknowledge a few things. There are many people involved in Bible translation and in these organizations who are far more righteous than I, and they are doing amazing work for the kingdom. At the same time, from my perspective, in Scripture, we see that there are many Christians who struggle with sin. And when large amounts of money are involved in any ministry context, bad things tend to happen, no matter how great those people are. 
For example, I'm reading a book from 1909 written about the history of simony in the first centuries of the church. So it goes up to the year 500. And basically the sin of paying or bribing people for your church office, whether it's a bishop or an elder or something like that, people were paying for the left and right bribing their way up to the leadership in different church contexts. This was so common that it was actually very noteworthy when someone in those early centuries of the church didn't do it. And that's just talking about the sin of simony, not even getting into other kinds of money-related sins that the church has been guilty of historically, like indulgences and pew rents, etc., So I think it would be fairly naive to say, oh no, these people are involved in Bible translation so they could never ever be capable of bad stewardship. But what would the Christian response of these organizations be if they are in the right in all of this? So the Christian response in my mind to this kind of critique or article would be to very patiently explain how they are in the right and how the math is either wrong or the claims in this article are wrong. And they can show it, they can justify it, and they have the records to demonstrate that. They could also very patiently explain how some of the complexities involved in Bible translation, like the death of translators, like corruption of different translation projects for one reason or another, those all factor into slowing things down, and a lot of that is outside of their control. So, in good faith, Before saying anything about this article on the podcast, I wanted to give the leadership of these organizations a chance to actually do what I just described and patiently speak to donors. And, you know, donors, I do do think, have the right to hear these kinds of explanations, even if they take days, months to explain. If you're giving millions of dollars to an organization, I think you do have the right to be educated by that organization on some of the finer points, some of the complexities that are involved in how that money is spent. And so I reached out to some of the leadership of these organizations like Wycliffe and Seed Company, and I asked them, okay, are you guys going to respond to this article? Please let me know when you do, because I would like to give you guys a chance before I talk about it on the podcast to speak for yourselves in this area. Because hopefully there's just been a misunderstanding and there's a great explanation for how this math doesn't line up. And so I was told, yeah, in January of 2022, we're going to release something on the homepage of the Illuminations website that will address this article. I said, great, that's wonderful. So all the organizations involved in E10 were told, we don't want any of you to address this individually. So Wycliffe, you can't talk about this. Seed Company, you can't talk about this individually. Uh, We as E10 or Illuminations will address this ourselves for everyone else. So I waited for that response and it never came. It still hasn't come. If somebody finds it, please let me know. But as far as I know, it doesn't exist. The person that I was in contact with who was telling me that it was going to come out when I followed up on it after it didn't, they never responded. Now, another thing I did right when the article came out was I reached out on map.bloomfire.com on this Bible translation forum, and I asked the question, has anyone responded to this article publicly? And I got a lot of interesting responses from people working in Bible translation all around the world. And it was interesting. One person compared doing a Bible translation, all the complexities and costs involved, compared it to raising a child. And I thought that was a really valuable comparison. And so I said, thanks, this is really helpful. Regarding raising a child, it's a good point. And most people would say that raising children well doesn't cost millions of dollars. In fact, if you introduce too much money into raising a child, you'll probably ruin your child. I wonder if that's the concern in this article. If I went around to churches telling them that I needed to raise $10 million to raise my kid well, I would only raise eyebrows. I think that may be the message coming across to many like the author, that Bible translation is no longer just hard, because it is hard. It is really hard. Now, it's exorbitantly expensive. 
I think military spending may be a good analogy here. I learned yesterday that if one toilet gets clogged on the new U.S. aircraft carriers, one toilet, it costs $400,000 to unclog it. And by the way, you can look that up if you want to know the ins and outs and the complexities of why that is true. So the question is, should it really cost that much? Should it? We all know that Bible translation has a high cost in energy, time, stress, trauma, etc. And that should be expected. But our organizations usually require us to de-emphasize these costs and give a chipper facade to donors. All the donors see is the marketing and begging for high dollar amounts without understanding where it's going. So it's no wonder people might start to suspect that it's being thrown at ridiculously expensive ways to unclog toilets. Is Bible translation spending money for the sake of spending money in some areas? Are they raising money for job security because they don't know what else they would do? As long as donors are ignored and not given clear answers to these questions by the leadership, we remain suspect and a target to more articles like this one. In my experience, the big organizations ignore these kinds of articles, and (laughs) they lived up to my experience, by the way. They ignore these kinds of articles and leave everyone with question marks instead of humbly and clearly responding with wisdom and detailed honesty. I can only pray that leaders take this seriously and actually respond publicly instead of hiding behind silence. I would genuinely welcome any leader to come on my podcast, Working for the Word, and respond to this article. Anyway, if you want to read other people's responses to this article on the forum, I will link that in the description as well. To my mind, the silence here from the leadership is deafening, and I would say it is suspect. You know, it does raise a lot of red flags. If you don't have an answer for these kinds of questions, these kind of basic simple math questions, then you probably do have something to hide. I mean, that's what you're inviting everyone to suspect. And I'm not here to make any enemies. I'm not here to assume the worst of anyone. Uh, All of these people who lead these organizations are probably much more godly, more wonderful people than I will ever be. And I say that sincerely, but at the same time, I don't know what they expect people to think by this kind of deafening silence. So if it is true, and some of the things in this article turn out to be actual sins or flaws or errors or mistakes on the part of these Bible translation organizations, then the question is, how is reform going to happen? Are they going to ever apologize for this? And the only real answer that comes to mind is that you guys listening to this podcast, you as donors, participants in this whole world of Bible translation, you have to speak up and ask hard questions of these organizations. The more donors that ask hard questions, the more these organizations will be forced to actually talk. They don't really care about what I say on this podcast, of course, but if a lot of donors take up their own responsibility as donors to ask the right questions, to ask hard questions, then we might see something happen. One of the things I want to highlight is that linguists, in my experience, don't tend to be reformers. Linguists who work for Bible translation organizations tend to want to just not bother anybody, not rock the boat. They want to work with their books and work on their linguistics and work on their translation stuff without causing any ruckus. Many of them will see grievous errors in their organization and never say anything because that's just their personality. There are very few exceptions to this. You know, we have exceptions like Eugene Nida and Cameron Townsend who were different personalities than the average linguist. And a lot of the people involved in Bible translation near the top, who have more clout, who have more influence, who know the people at the top, they tend to be part of an aging generation, and a lot of them are heading towards retirement. And when you're heading towards retirement, you don't want to rock the boat. That's not really the time for that. You just want to retire in peace. So once again, they may have the influence to make a change. They may have the influence to speak up, but they don't. 
because they just want to finish well without stirring up controversy. And I don't blame them, but I just want to highlight that so that you can understand why the bureaucracy remains calcified. These organizations at the end of the day have become so big that they're impossible to turn. You know, it's like a giant ship. It's so big that now to turn it, it might take years to turn its direction by just one degree. Once again, I want to make it really clear. There may be really good, satisfying answers to the questions raised in this article, but we will never know those answers unless the leadership of these organizations respond. And I want to make another thing really clear. Bible translation agencies are not being bombarded constantly by these kinds of articles. It's not like every five minutes someone is writing a scathing opinion piece against the Bible translation organizations. It's not happening. Maybe that was happening at one point during the Son of God controversy, but it's not happening anymore. So my question is, what excuse do they have not to respond to this article in humility and love and patience to explain to everyone? And to me, unfortunately, that kind of silence comes across as patronization and paternalism, the kind of attitude that just pats the donors on the head and says, thanks for your money. Don't ask me any questions. I'm the expert here. And probably the complexities of how we do Bible translation, how we spend the money that you just gave us is too much for your poor little brain to handle. So I would just like to encourage the Bible translation organizations named in this article, if you're listening out there, maybe consider how this is coming across as I just described. And I'm still giving you the benefit of the doubt and I hope others do too. But there's only so long that people can just give you the benefit of the doubt if you treat us with silence, right? We're not coming at you with pitchforks. We just want to know some simple answers. And I think it would be so edifying to the body of Christ if we were able to hear from you with honesty and patience. So that's my take on the article. Once again, I would encourage you to read it for yourself. Read the responses on the MAP forum and also to speak to the people you know in Bible translation about this. Ask them hard questions. Encourage the leadership, if you know them, to be part of a movement towards more transparency. You know, one of the things that would be really great is if these ministries had their own podcasts where they could talk about things like this and respond regularly to things like this, explaining things thoroughly. Long-form podcasts are the only way to really do that. And it's astonishing to me that even after COVID, there's not a single Bible translation organization that has that kind of podcast. Anyway, that's all from me. Thanks again for listening. This is Working for the Word, a podcast where we believe that the Bible is a unified, God-breathed, God-centered, hope-giving book, sweeter than honey and pointing to Jesus. Jesus.